Uh, it's an enormous pleasure for me to present, to, to introduce Ciro Ciliberto, uh, whom I've known for a depressingly large number of years, is really <laughs> uh, a lot. Uh, it's, uh, Ciro is a distinguished algebraic geometer. Uh, he's the author of over uh, 200 uh, research papers who is uh, a notable, among other things, for his uh, extremely wide uh, cultural interest, uh, which includes, which include, uh, well, certainly the history of mathematics, in particular the history of algebraic geometry, in which he has authored uh, many, many important papers, uh, and other things too. I, he is even the author of a book of short stories. I don't know if I should say this. Uh, Besides this, I don't know how he finds the time, but he has, uh, a, he has, he has done other things too, and in, in particular is notable for his service to the profession. Uh, among other things, uh, in particular, is currently the president of the Unione Matematica Italiana. He'll be talking about the topic, is a, is a great one, is a fantastic topic, enumerative geometry is a, a field that uh, uh, it used to be uh, very important in classical times. The idea is to somehow count how many objects there are with certain properties. And it has experienced a, a great rebirth in the 90s. It was a really remarkable phenomenon due to the interactions with uh, string theory. Uh, so it's, uh, I'll, I'll leave the, 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 the microphone to him. Okay, thank you very much for, no, I have the microphone. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and for the nice words. So let me start with the explaining the topic. Um, so, so, um, the, so, I'm sorry, I have to sit down and, uh, and look closely to the, to the screen. So, uh, the, what is the subject and uh, what is the prehistory of the subject? So, if one has a family of geometric objects which depend on a certain number of parameters, one may look at uh, members of this family which enjoy, uh, which verify as many conditions as the number of parameters. So, one expects that uh, the solutions are finitely many. So, the enumerative geometry deals exactly with the problem of computing the members, the number of the members of the families enjoying these properties. So the prehistory goes back to Apollonius in the uh, third century before Christ. Um, deals with the problem, several problems in enumerative geometry. In one of the propositions of his book, Conics, he poses the problem of understanding how many conics pass through five general points in the plane. And the answer to the problem, he says, one, only one. So uh, in another paper, uh, which has been lost, but we have a report by Pappus, fourth century uh, after Christ, he uh, stated a problem which became famous as Apollonius' problem. So how many circles are tangent to three given general circles in the plane? And he answers the problem with the geometric construction, and he finds eight as a solution. So here you see there is uh, a little picture. And there is another picture there, which is due to Viet uh, much later. And uh, you see, you can, instead of taking three circles, OK, you take three circles with radius 0 which means three points. And look at how many circles are tangent to these circles with the zero radius. The only way of being tangent is to pass through the points. So you see only one. But uh, each one, each passing through a point, is, counts for two solutions. So it's two times two times two, which is eight. So you see this, this little uh, way of approaching a problem, which is we will find this. Uh, 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 in a moment back. So, uh, uh, in. No, no, it is a proof. <laughs> well, today it is. Today it is a proof. So, today it is a proof. Now, now let me explain. 
Uh, so, uh, as we know, Descartes introduced in the um, uh, 17th century Cartesian coordinates, and in this way, he translated geometric problems into uh, algebraic problems and vice versa. And uh, uh, the use of Cartesian coordinates basically marks the beginning of algebraic geometry and uh, of uh, uh, enumerative geometry as a part of algebraic geometry. Uh, so, um, how can we set up Apollonius' uh, uh, problem in, in, in this way? So, you take, you take a circle, a general circle, and everybody knows from uh, high school that the equation is a square plus uh, y square plus ax plus a, uh, b eps, uh, by plus c equal to zero. This depends on three parameters, a, b, c, or another way of saying this, the center and the radius. Uh, centers two parameters and the radius one. Uh, so it, it has to be tangent, if a circle has to be tangent to the circle with center the origin and radius one, you end up writing this system C, which is the circle of radius one and center the origin, and the other one is the line, which you get by making the system between the two. And the line has to be tangent to the circle. And in order to be tangent to the circle, it has to be uh, to have uh, 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 distance equal to the radius from the, the center, and you end up with the second degree equation on, uh, in A, B, C that you see at the bottom. Now, mm, uh, uh, if we fix two more general circles uh, and impose to the general uh, circle to be tangent to the other two, we have three equations of degree two. And Apollonius says, okay, not Apollonius, Cartes, uh, Descartes says, okay, the number of solutions of three equations of degree two in the three parameters A, B, C is eight. Why it is eight? So let's go to the next, uh, uh, to the next picture. Why eight? Well, eight is two times two times two, as in the eight uh, uh, approach. Uh, and this is the content of Bezout theorem. Bezout theorem says that uh, if you have R hypersurfaces with homogeneous equations, if i equal to zero in r plus one uh, parameters of degree di in projective space over the complex numbers, then either they intersect in as many points as the product of the degrees counted with multiplicity, or they have in common a variety of positive dimension, which means they have in common infinitely many points. If they have finitely many points, the number of points is given by the product of the degrees, counting each point with a certain multiplicity. So here there is a picture. Two curves of degree 3 meet at 9 points, a curve of degree 2, and a curve of degree 4 meet at 8 points. Now, Bezout theorem uh, has an analytic version, which I have shown uh, uh, at the bottom. So if the two plane curves have equation f equals zero and g equals zero, d1 plus uh, d1 times d2 is given by a certain integral. Hmm? It's a uh, mm, uh, complex analytic hmm? uh, uh, version. Okay. Now, there are two, two issues here uh, in, in what I said in the previous uh, slide. The two issues are complex numbers and projective space. Why complex numbers and why projective space? Well, complex numbers are essential in this respect that uh, for Bezout theorem is fundamental to have the fundamental theorem of algebra. Fundamental theorem of algebra says that if you have a polynomial equation of degree n, then this has exactly n solutions provided you count each solution with the appropriate multiplicity. So, for basically, Bezout theorem says the following. If you have uh, 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 R equations in R variables, you solve the first one in one variable, substitute into the other, and then go on, go on, and you end up with the final equation of degree equal to the product of the degree, and you solve this. This is basically the idea. Now, uh, uh, for the fundamental theorem of algebra, on the other hand, it is essential to have complex numbers. This works on complex numbers, otherwise it doesn't work, right? So complex numbers, we know, everybody knows, has been introduced, have been introduced in the 16th century by Italian geometers exactly to solve equations. So 
Moreover, the fundamental theorem of algebra is an analytic proof based on Cauchy residue formula, which is um, Cacciopoli, Martinelli, Bochner formula is exactly an extension of this to higher, uh, to, to more variables. Why projective spaces? Well, the projective space, projective, the concept of projective space has been introduced by artists in the, in the 15th century uh, for problems due to drawing. Mm? Uh, 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 the process of introducing, so the, the projective space is obtained by adding to the usual space the points at infinity, which are basically the directions of the lines. And this is essential in enumerative geometry because when you have two curves which intersect, say, in the plane and move them, hmm, make a reasonable continuous movement of these curves, uh, an intersection of these curves can go to infinity and you don't want to lose it, right? So think about two lines which intersect and then they move and become parallel. They intersect at infinity. You don't want to lose this intersection. And also, you have another example here, no? A conic and a line meet in general in two points, according to Bezout theorem. But, you know, if you have a parabola and the axis of the parabola, they meet only at one point that you see. The other point is the point at infinity of the parabola. So you have to add these points in order not to lose intersections. Yeah? You don't want the intersections to run away. So it, the... the, 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 the particular feature of projective space is that it is compact. Compact means that any reasonable sequence of points have, has a limit in this space. Uh -huh. uh, 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 and this is essential to get hold on the, the, you know, all the solutions of the enumerative problem that you, that you want. Uh, uh, so working with so this other lesson that we learn, not, not only we need complex number, but we need to work in a compact space in order to get hold of all solutions of our way. Even if we start in a space which is not compact, we have to compactify it to make a reasonable enumerative geometry. So the uh, 19th century is the classical age for enumerative geometry. Uh, 19th century saw uh, a, 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 an outburst of uh, uh, um, techniques and ideas and uh, one of the main characters uh, in our story is Poncelet. Poncelet starts with the systematic use of complex numbers in projective geometry, and he introduces two basic concepts, the concept of duality and the concept of uh, the, the principle of conservation of the number. What, is, what are these two ideas? Duality is very simple. Duality is the following. No, you take the plane, projective plane, and take... Uh, look at all the lines in this plane. These lines can be considered as points in a projective space. This is the dual projective space. The dual projective space, the dual projective plane is described, parameterizes the lines of the first. And the dual of the dual is the projective plane that you started with. So if you take a curve, the dual of the curve is the set of all tangent lines to this curve. And then you can take the dual to the dual, and you go back to the original curve. So here there is a picture of two curves, one dual to the other. So if you start with a very nice curve, say a smooth curve with no singularities, the dual can have singularities. But then if you go back, you find something which has no singularity. So if you start with a configuration or with a theorem in a projective space, uh, this automatically gives you a dual configuration and the dual theorem. And the two, two theorems are equivalent to each other. So if, for instance, if instead of uh, taking, uh, asking yourself how many lines pass, how many conics pass through five general points in the plane, you can ask how many dual conics are tangent uh, to five uh, general lines. But the dual of a conic is a conic. So uh, Apollonius theorem can be translated by saying that if you take five general lines in the plane, there is a unique conic, which is tangent to these lines. Okay? So this is what Poncelet realized. Okay. Now we come to a great uh, question, 
which was uh, uh, posed by, well, actually it was not posed, it was a theorem which uh, uh, Steiner, uh, was a great character, so the first half of 19th century, uh, a theorem that he stated and, uh, 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 with the wrong answer. Uh, the, 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 he generalizes the question that uh, Apollonius asked. So, I mean, how many conics are tangent to five general conics? Uh, so, conics depends on five parameters, which are the equations, the, 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 take the equation of a general conic. There are six coefficients, but the six coefficients are given up to a constant. So, the conics fill up a projective space of dimension five. So they depend on five parameters. So you can impose five conditions. If you impose five points, there is only one. If you impose five tangencies, there is only one. So Steiner says, OK, let's take five general conics, and let's look at how many conics are tangent to these five conics. OK, he says six to the fifth. This seven, 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 six. It soon, was soon discovered that this was wrong. And uh, 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 this became then famous as Steiner's problem. Why it is wrong? Again, I mean, this, is, this I already said. Take the equation of a general conic. Now, this depends on six parameters, the coefficients. Now, the, the conic uh, has degree five, has degree two, right? So x squared, y squared, xy, x, y, and one. These are the only monomials that are allowed in the equations, no? so there are six. But this is given up to a constant, because I can multiply the equation by a constant and get the same conic. OK, so five parameters. Being tangent to a conic, given conic C, can be expressed by uh, polynomial equation. This polynomial equation is degree six. So Steiner says, OK, we have five polynomials of degree six in six variables. What is the number of solutions? Apply Bezout, the six to the fifth power. No, this is wrong. Why it is wrong? The point is that it is wrong because all these polynomials, so remember, Bezout theorem says that either you have finitely many solutions, and then it is given by the right number, or the polynomials have a common uh, uh, variety, vanish uh, along a common variety of positive dimension, infinitely many solutions. This is exactly what happens. So if you take all the conics, which are given by a line squared, uh, these are polynomials of degree two, all of these polynomials, these are all tangent hmm, in uh, quotation mark to the, the given conics. So there, are two, there is a two-dimensional family of conics which enjoy this property. So that's not good. So this is the so-called Veronese surface. So, uh, 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 sorry. Um, so, the solution to Steiner's problem, uh, uh, how can one uh, find this? So, this uh, uh, correct number was found uh, in 1859 by De Jonquier, who did not publish it because Schaas was too, uh, sorry, because Steiner was too famous. And uh, Schaas, some years later, in 1864, published the solution, introducing the uh, concept of the theory of characteristic numbers. What, uh, what Charles does, basically, in, in his old-fashioned uh, uh, style, uh, is a concept which is very common uh, 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 nowadays, became very common nowadays. So you have all these polynomials, these five polynomials, which intersect along a positive dimensional variety. Eh? So you have a certain number of solutions which are counted by this variety, right? And you have to subtract this number from the sixth to the fifth eh? to get the right number. So what Schassel does is what we do, uh, we know nowadays as blowing up. He blows up this variety. And the concept of blowing up is like making a surgery Right, which you know, cuts this variety and substituted it with a much higher uh, uh, dimensional variety, which enables to, you to see what happens there. Uh, so I made this little picture here. Right, this is the blowing up of a point in the plane. Hmm? 
So the blowing up, you blow up a point in the plane. Substitute the, the, the point that you blow up with the line and leave everything else untouched. So what happens there at the point, you can see in this line. So if you have a curve in the plane passing through the point and you look at the pullback of this curve on the blow up, you see, for instance, if the curve is singular as a self-intersection, you separate this self-intersection upstairs. So this is uh, what, um, what uh, uh, Schassel did, basically, and he came up with the right number. And um, although in non-completely rigorous way. Yeah. So uh, some years later, Schubert, uh, uh, using a mixture of all these techniques that we've been talking about, uh, uh, principle of conservations of the number, duality, uh, blowing up in this old-fashioned way, he found the number on numbers uh, very interesting. Uh, most of them have been recalculated nowadays, but there are still some which are not known whether they are correct or not. For, for example, he computed the number of quadrics, which are degree two hypersurfaces in P3. They depend on nine parameters number of quadrics which are tangent to nine given quadrics in general position. And you have a similar phenomenon as, as before. So at the end of uh, 19th century, this was the situation. And uh, most of you know that uh, David Hilbert uh, at uh, the Second International Congress of Mathematicians in Paris he uh, presented 23 famous problems, which, are, which were unknown at the time. And uh, uh, he actually presented only 10 there, but then he published 23 uh, of them. And these have been very influential in, in the development of mathematics of the last century. And um, uh, uh, his 15th problem was exactly to give rigorous foundation to Schubert's enumerative calculus. So this was considered to be one of the main open mathematical problems of today. So uh, you see here I reported the uh, uh, exact statement of what Hilbert says. And um, he says, you know that uh, Hilbert was an optimistic. Uh, was, uh, he, he thought that everything could, could be solved. And in fact, this can be solved. Uh, uh, this is something interesting. Although the algebra of today guarantees, in principle, the possibility of carrying out the process of elimination, which was the thing that I was talking about before, yet the proof of the theorems of enumerative geometry decidedly more is requisite, namely the actual carrying out of the process of elimination in the case of equations of special form, blah, blah, blah. So he was asserting that the algebra at the time was strong enough to solve the problem. It was not, so it was right, basically. OK. Now, this opens up a new area, uh, uh, which I would call the neoclassical age, which takes you know, the 70 years from the beginning of, 19, of uh, 20th century to the 70s, but still, actually, is still going on partly this, this area. The, the, the problem was to ask, uh, to, to solve uh, Hilbert's 15 problem, right, basically. Uh, the first attempt had been made immediately after mm, mm, uh, Hilbert. Even in uh, 1902, there is a long memoir by Francesco Severi in which he tries, he tries to answer this problem. He introduces a number of very beautiful ideas. And, uh, but his work, which has been going on for, for years, starting from since then, uh, um, was sprinkled with a, no, a, a lot of serious mistakes, besides very brilliant ideas. And uh, you know, I, I mention, I quote here, this sentence of David Mumford, which has been one of the most brilliant mathematicians uh, uh, last century, is still working, by the way. Uh, he says, it is hard to untangle everywhere what Severi conjectured and what he proved. And unfortunately, some of his conclusions are incorrect. So basically, 
the criticisms against uh, the 19th century approach uh, have been <laughs> overcome by the criticism to Savelle's approach. He left the field uh, in much more, basically, much more mess even than, than, than before. Uh, anyway, in the So you seek. happen that it is pinched, this, this thing is pinched, or it self-intersects. So you see, if it's, the, the simplest way it can, can self-intersect is just, you know, that there are two branches which meet transversely. This is called the node, hmm? and it's pictured in the bottom to the left. Uh, the pinching, the simplest pinching is called the cusp. Hmm? And it is shown on the, on, the, on the right. OK. Now, if the curve is singular, one can desingularize it, removing the singularity. How do we do this? We do this by a blow up. This is the same picture that I, I, I showed before, right? You have the singularity, this node, for instance, in the plane. You blow up the, 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 the point where is the node. And then upstairs, you see this curve having no longer uh, the, the node. You have two branches, uh, which go to the two branches downstairs. In this case, the genus of this new curve, this smooth curve, is called the genus of the old singular curve. And then there is a basic formula, which was worked out by Klebs, who was a student of uh, Riemann, which computes the genus in terms of the degree of the curve and the number of nodes. G is equal to d minus 1 times d minus 2 divided by 2 minus the number uh, of nodes. Curves which have a maximum number of nodes have genus 0. Hmm? Maximum number of nodes is d minus 1 mi times d minus 2 divided by 2. These curves are called rational. The reason why they are called rational is, that, is because they can be parameterized with rational functions, or in a certain way, the easiest mm, mm, uh, uh, curves. And uh, mm, the desingularization is a sphere, is a curve with genus zero. Genus, the, curve with, the sphere is nothing less than the plane with a point. We added the point, right? It's, this is the take a sphere, project it to the plane, and then, you know, project it to the plane from a point, and you get that the sphere minus the point is the plane. And then, in order to get the sphere back, you have to add the point. So it's, this is like projective, projective P1, uh, projective space of dimension 1 is the C plus the point at infinity. OK. Now, severi varieties. What is uh, uh, the concept of severi variety? Take all curves of degree D. Inside the projective space of curves of degree d, which has dimension r d, you consider uh, you can consider the set of all irreducible curves, which are nodal m nodes and genus g. The number of nodes, according to Klebsch formula, is d minus one times d minus two divided by two minus g. Okay, this is called. Now, this family of curves is called the severi variety. 
of type DG. Now, Severi proved in uh, 1921 that this gadget here is an algebraic variety. So it's defined by algebraic polynomials. And the dimension is equal to the dimension of the whole space minus the number of nodes. So imposing a node, each node imposes one condition, Dro drops the dimension by one. In particular, rational curves, which have the maximum number of nodes, uh, uh, depend on the total number of parameters at d minus d minus 1 times d minus 2 divided by 2, which is 3d minus 1. Okay, so he also stated that this variety is irreducible, meaning this is one piece. You know? uh, uh, this argument was uh, uh, wrong, and the proof has been given only in 1986 by Joe Harris. Anyway, the question is, the basic problem that I was talking about is compute the so-called severity numbers. Severity numbers are the degrees of severity varieties, which in other terms means the following. Yeah, severity variety depends on Rd minus delta, which is 3D minus 1 minus G. It's a family huh, of curves depending on this number of parameters. Now, fix 3D minus G plus 1 points in the plane generically, if you have fixed as many conditions as parameters, there will be finitely many curves enjoying this. You have to compute this number. Okay? This is. Now, in particular, you can ask this for rational curves. Fix 3D minus 1 general points in the plane and ask how many nodal rational curves pass through these points. Now, the first numbers are easy. Huh? How many lines pass through two points? This is Euclides, one. How many conics pass through five points? This is Apollonius, one. Well, now it starts being a little bit more complicated. No? How many nodal cubics pass through eight general points in the plane? And this is something that you don't learn in high school. Right? The number is 12. This was computed by Chasle. Well, with a little bit more effort, 19th century mathematics can also answer to the question, how many quartix of, with three nodes pass through 11 points given in the plane? General 11 points given. The number is 620. Besides this, no way. Classical methods would not work. Why do we care? So uh, uh, around... Uh, 1990, theoretical physics discovered unexpected connection between the problem of computing severity varieties, uh, severity degrees, and string theory. So the basic object of string theory is a string, hmm, a little loop, which evolves in space. When the string evolves in space, describes a surface. Hmm? And uh, in the string model, the, 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 the string evolves a string theory model, the string evolves in a variety which is a compact algebraic variety of dimension 3 of a special type, the so called Calabiao variety. But from a mathematical viewpoint, we can ask ourselves, we can replace this variety with any other variety that we like, right? To start with, with the simplest variety that we know, the plane. Okay, let's pretend that we want to make string theory in the plane rather than in a, in a um, Calabiao variety. Okay, physicists also discovered that some important functions in several mathematical models of quantum field theories can be expressed as series whose coefficients are important geometrical invariants of the variety V. It turns, out, it turns out that these can be recursively computed if the function verifies some differential equation. So let me be more explicit. Uh, uh, so, for example, consider this series, f of x and y. This is the summation for d from 1 to infinity. And d is the degree of severity varieties, so nodal curves of degree d, rational nodal curves of degree d. And then there is this, uh, this other uh, uh, coefficient there. 
Okay. Uh, Kontsevich proved in 1993 that this uh, function verifies a differential equation, so-called WDVV equation, which I've written there. Uh, this equation puts constraint on the coefficients of the series and translates in the, uh, 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 in the recursive formula, which I've written uh, there. Now, if you start with uh, Euclides and Apollonius, which give you the first numbers, using this uh, uh, recursion formula, you can compute all the numbers. Okay? Uh, so you find n5, n6, n7, and so on. And you see this grow rather quickly. Now, today we have uh, different proof, algebra geometric proofs of this, uh, 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 given. Actually, the proof was given by Ziv Rand, sort of incomprehensible proof, uh, uh, which nobody understood in 87, even before uh, Konsevich. And then uh, uh, Caporaso Arles gave uh, much more understandable proof in 98, uh, Ravi Vakil a couple of years later. Uh, these um, proofs um, use a completely different uh, uh, viewpoint, which is a high-level form of Poncelet principle of conservation of the number, which I am not able to, to explain now. But anyway, what I would like to, to say is um, what is the concept which is behind this uh, number? Why do we really care about them? So these uh, numbers N, D, are special instances of the so-called Gromov-Witten invariance. So let's look at uh, 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 the family, the set, of all uh, curves of genus G plus N distinct points on each one of them. This is an algebraic variety. And uh, this variety is dimension 3G minus 3 plus N. Uh, unless G and, and N are rather low, which I will disregard. Now, this variety is not compact, but it can be easily compactified with so-called stable curves. Anyway, don't care. It's nice compactification, rather easy to construct, rather easy to figure out. So, for instance, uh, the compactification of M03 is simply one point. The compactification of M04, so curves of, degree, uh, of genus 0 with four points, is a line, is P1, and so on. Now, consider the set M bar 0 N D of all pairs. The first pair is a point in this M0 N, and the second element of the pair is a map of the curve C to the plane, in such a way that the image is a curve of degree D. Now, one computes the parameters from which all this business depends, this is a compact variety of dimension 3D minus 1 plus N. And there's decent singularities. OK. Now, for each I from 1 to M, we have the map to P2. Huh? We can associate to the pair huh, given by the curve, the points, and F, the image of the ith point. If x is a point in the plane, if we take the pullback of this point, this is a co-dimension 2 variety in this large variety. OK. In particular, if I take m0, 3d minus 1, and I pull back 3d minus 1 general points, I have to intersect 3d minus 1 co-dimension 2 points inside the variety of dimension the double, and I get finitely many points. And this is the number. And this is given by an integral computed in this large modular space, as for Bezout theorem. OK. Similarly, this is for rational curve. Similarly, one can define the, uh, uh, one can consider in the similar way the um, severity numbers for higher genus as intersections inside these large varieties. And these are uh, 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 the Gromov-Witten invariants. 
this gromov witten invariants, uh, uh, the, the amazing fact that they give an enormous amount of information on the variety V mm, on in which we are operating. And the larger is dimension of the variety, the more information they give. This is an interesting fact. Anyway, another way of looking at this is that the gromov witten invariants can be understood uh, as uh, giving a quantum deformation of the intersection product of the inside the variety. Mm -hmm. And um, in this setting, the differential equation can be read as uh, an associativity property of the intersection ring. Anyway, these are things which I just mentioned for people who know what I'm talking about. Anyway, let me finish by uh, 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 taking a completely different viewpoint. Uh, so, tropical geometry. What is tropical geometry? Tropical geometry is a completely new area of mathematics which has been developed in the last 15 years. Uh, actually, tropical mathematics was founded in the 80s. In, in Brazil, and that's why it has been uh, called tropical, um, uh, uh, for completely different reasons. This has been um, considered by computer scientists. And tropical geometry has been considered uh, starting uh, 2002, more or less. So the basic object in tropical uh, uh, geometry, tropical algebra, is um, the same I ring the same I ring is the following is uh, think about the field like R huh? so you have the sum hmm? and the sum every element has an opposite right uh, in the in the same I ring uh, all the operation works in the, in the same way, but the sum has no opposite. That's the only thing, the only difference. So and the sum is defined, so you take R, real numbers, plus minus infinity. This is the, 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 the set. And you have the two operations, plus and, and times. Plus is the maximum between the two elements. A plus B is the maximum between A and B. And the product is the sum. So this is a little trick. So you can consider tropical polynomials. Hmm? So I wrote down a tropical polynomial of degree 2. And the tropical polynomial of degree 2 turns out to be a function. It's the maximum between certain sums. Right? And uh, this is a function which is locally linear, piecewise linear. And there are points where it is not linear. It's the intersection of the graph is the intersection of two linear parts. And this is the corner locus. It's called the corner locus. The locus where it is not linear is a graph in the plane. And this is called a tropical curve. OK, what, uh, what is behind this? Well, behind this, there is the logarithm. The logarithm linearizes monomials and somehow triggers the tropicalization of polynomials. So look at the plane curve and transform it via the logarithm. Hmm? Take the logarithm of the modulus of the variables and take the image. When you make the image of a curve via this map, you get something in, in the real plane. And this something looks like what I, the picture that I made there. You, on the left, you see uh, uh, the image of uh, the, 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 a line. Then in the second picture, the image of a conic. And then the image of a cubic. These are called amoebas. Hmm? And uh, what is uh, relevant is that the limits of the amoebas in a well-defined mathematical sense, are the tropical curves, and vice versa. So it's basically uh, the, 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 there is a correspondence between tropical curves in the plane and real curves. And, you know, 
occurs via this process of uh, taking the logarithm. So if you start with the curve of degree d and make its tropicalization in this way, the, 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 the tropicalization is a graph which has uh, d uh, tentacles uh, in the direction of the negative x-axis, negative y-axis, and positive bisector of the x and y-axis. Uh, like I have pictures there. And you can define uh, what a singular tropical curve is. This is a little bit uh, complicated, but uh, uh, not so much, in fact. So, for instance, look at the uh, curve that I pictured in the second line here on the, on the left. Uh, this is the union of two lines. Hmm? And it has a node. Hmm? It has a node where the two lines meet. Yeah? when the blue and the, uh, and the uh, red line meet. So you can consider the so-called dual subdivision. So you consider the triangle hmm? uh, uh, that I pictured, the second one. Huh? Uh, uh, the curve can be obtained in the following way. No? Take a vertex of the tropical curve and put it in the center of the, sub the subdivision and then draw the orthogonal lines to the, uh, to the edges of the triangle, okay? And vice versa. You can, can construct tropical curves from subdivisions of the triangle and vice versa. And the node corresponds, a singularity corresponds to a piece of the subdivision of the triangle which is not a triangle, okay? So this, uh, so you can, in other words, you can make sense of what a singular tropical curve is. Bezu theorem as meaning in, in the tropical world. Like, you know, for instance, uh, um, uh, you see there a conic, a tropical conic in red, and a tropical line, and they meet in two points. Or in one point in the second picture, but then it has multiplicity too, and so on. Now, the idea is that... Uh, uh, I cannot go into details too much, but uh, you can compute the severity numbers using tropical geometry. Mm? So there is a mechanism. It is not so strange if one thinks about what I've been saying so far, right? Curves, tropical curves are limit of real curves, right? So there is a way of detecting from tropical curves passing through a certain number of points, how many real curves pass through <coughs> these points, and how many singular curves pass through these points. So there is a mechanism to do this, and it is purely combinatorial. This has been done by Michalkin and uh, co-authors, particularly Bruegelet. Uh, they constructed a beautiful way of, of, uh, of uh, computing these severity numbers using using uh, uh, tropical curves. Now, the, um, I, I do not have time to, to enter into details now, but I just wanted to mention that these tropical uh, uh, um, varieties, as we define tropical curves, we can define tropical varieties. Uh, there is a beautiful tropical variety, which is uh, um, uh, uh, this variety Tn. Tn is the variety which parametrizes, the so-called BHB space, which parametrizes all weighted phylogenetic trees uh, on end leaves. So the tree is a graph uh, uh, which has no cycle. And the phylogenetic tree is uh, a tree which has one vertex of valence two. There are only two sides leaving the vertex. And uh, there are internal vertices with, which have higher valence, and then final vertices which have valence one. These are the leaves. Hmm? So you have a root, and then you have leaves. Leaf, th th these are very common in phylogenetics. So the root is the common ancestor, and the leaves are the species that you look at, right? And then you can fix length of the 
internal arcs. And the length typically measure the probability of the number of mutations of DNA segments, uh, certain DNA segments. Uh, this business here uh, uh, is a variety. It's a tropical variety. It's a tropical variety which is made up by a certain number of ortans. Ortans are you know, products of, it's like quadrant, right? It's generalization of the quadrant, right? R plus times R plus. And the number of ortans is the Schroeder number. It goes very, very quickly. So the amazing fact is that this TN is the tropicalization of the moduli spaces that uh, I've been considering before. So there is no, it's not strange that tropical geometry enters in, in this kind of computation. So here on the left, uh, there is T3. T3 measures, parameterizes the, uh, um, the trees with three leaves. And there are only three types. Hmm? And then you see immediately T4 is much worse, right? It's 15 ortons, which are glued hmm, in a suitable way. And basically, this is a cone over the Peterson graph. Peterson graph is this thing that I drew to the right. Uh, uh, you have a pentagon and another pentagon. And you could consider, in principle, the, the prism over the pentagon. And then you switch it, right? You, instead of, of gluing vertex 1 with vertex 1, you glue vertex 1 with vertex 2, vertex 2 with vertex 4, and so on. Huh? And you get a graph which is not planar. Anyway, anyway, let me finish by, by uh, 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 saying just in a couple of slides what I've been trying to do in, in this mess. Uh, uh, um, recently, in the last years. So work in progress in the attempt of computing this new PN0 are analogs of the severity numbers. For uh, uh, analogs of severity numbers for uh, rational curves uh, on certain surfaces, which are Calabi-Yau surfaces. As I said, String theory is interesting on Calabi-Yau varieties. But Calabi-Yau varieties of dimension three, actually. Well, first approximation is to work on Calabi-Yau surfaces of dimension two, which are K3 surfaces. And the analogs of severity numbers are this new PN. And what I've been doing with Thomas Dedier is to um, try to compute these numbers. These numbers are known for, in certain cases, uh, but not in general. So there is still a lot of work to do. And I have been, with Tomai, we have been considering to uh, uh, compute this number by making the generations, so applying this principle of conservation of the number, which is available nowadays, by the generating the K3 surface to a union of planes. And what we are considering is the so-called pillow of the generation, which I do not have time here. There is some graph which, uh, um, which uh, will explain what kind of degeneration we consider. And uh, the, 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 the surfaces being a union of planes as a bunch of singularities, and the limits of the curves are concentrated atomically around the singularities. So one has to understand locally what happens. Huh? And what we have to do is to make a rather complicated number of moves to understand how many singularities go, how many singular curves go to the singularity. In order to do this, we have to make these moves which are basically blow up. Uh, 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 flips, twists, which are typical moves in birational geometry. And uh, just to impress you by the mess that can happen. Uh, 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 so, for instance, if one looks at the limit of rational curves 
in uh, the uh, a general quartic surface in P3, which is the first instance of a K3, uh, when the, the, the quartic degenerates to four planes, to a, a tetrahedron in P3, but one has to make a number of modification of blow up and twist, which leads to the picture to the left, to have a complete picture of the situation. And if one consider the degeneration of a general K3 surface of degree 8 to an octahedron, one has to make an easier actual picture, which is the thing to the right. OK, let me just finish with the last slide by uh, with a quotation from this book that I was mentioning by Eisenberg and Darris, uh, uh, which explains the meaning of working in, in enumerative geometry. So they say the problem is emblematic, about Steiner problem, no? They say the problem is emblematic of the dual nature of the subject. On the one hand, the number itself is of little significance. Life would not be materially dif different if there were more or fewer. But the fact that the problem is well posed and that we can, in fact, determine that number is at the heart of algebraic geometry. And the insight developed in the pursuit of, rigor, of rigorous derivation of the number, the recognition of the need, and introduction of a new parameter space for plane conics, and the understanding of why intersection products are well defined for this space are landmarks in the development of algebraic geometry. OK, thank you for the attention. If anyone has comments or questions, please. Okay. So we have uh, we have seen uh, several recent innovations, uh, such as the severity varieties in uh, tropical geometry, with uh, allow to which allow to solve problems which were uh, in precedent formerly not solvable and. Uh, Previously, in the historical introduction, you quoted, you talked about uh, Cartesio, uh, Cartesio's introduction of uh, uh, analytic geometry, which uh, uh, also al allowed to solve the cl classical problems which uh, the Greek could not solve. Well, I can't uh, avoid the feeling that, uh, at least in Cartesio's case, it was more a changing of the definition of solving a problem. I mean, Apollonio was, well, was aware of the properties of the curves he was looking for, which are encoded by the equation. But from the point of view of Greek maths, the object uh, wa was not the equation, but was the curve, the uh, object on the plane. So if the problem was construct that curve and uh, not solve the equation of the curve. If uh, Cartesio solved several problems, but he solved it in the sense that he solved the equation, but uh, if uh, Apollonio had uh, algebra, he, he would not have seen I solved the problem. The problem for me was find a real way to construct uh, the curve. Now, in the case uh, of the recent development, I would like to understand how much they rely on uh, computational tools that were not uh, previously uh, av av available. I mean, uh, we have seen uh, tropicalization, you have uh, a polynomial curve and you uh, apply a map which takes the logarithm of the module so you can compute uh, intersection invariance from them. And uh, you, w we have seen a wonderful picture of uh, very complicated uh, figures from which we can, count, uh, we, we can count the invariant. So I would like to understand more. Surely it's uh, interesting, there, there are new uh, ideas, but uh, new interesting mathematical ideas, but how much this relies of new uh, 
tools and how much of uh, development uh, that uh, in principle, uh, sorry from my bad pronunciation, made it better I switched to Italian. Okay. <laughs> So in the Cartesian time in the 18th century, there were uh, appeared a uh, table of logarithms. Many people started uh, building ships, making uh, calculations, and so people started printing a table of logarithms. So table of logarithms were uh, meant to make multiplication very fast. And so uh, the principal object of study switched from the geometry to the number. I think you made the point. Yeah. So, if I understand well, certainly the concept of solving a problem, a geometric problem, uh, from uh, Apollonius to Descartes, and nowadays, changed completely because for Greek, uh, for Greek mathematicians, solving a problem was, a geometric problem was to exhibit a construction, a geometric construction, which would produce the result, okay? So solving the problem, Apollonius' problem was, okay, I give you three circles and you tell me how to construct the eight circles, in other words, what are their centers and their radial, their radiuses, which solve the problem. No, for us, so we basically don't care, right? Whether it is good or not, I don't know, right? It's, it's like, you know, using complex numbers, right? To solve the equations, right? So you know that you have to, so you simplify the question, right? because otherwise you would uh, say, okay, take a polynomial, a real polynomial of degree 100, and say, what are the solutions of this? You have to discuss several cases, right? It's a huge mess. We, you know, compactify things by saying, okay, we use complex numbers, always 100 solutions, period. Now, this is one part of, of your question. I think the second part of your question was <clears throat> these solutions that we are talking about. Hmm? Uh, 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 so certainly they, you know, are based on completely new ideas, like you know this Grom of Witten invariance. This uh, the fact that the solutions to our problems are intersection numbers in certain remote varieties. This is which have a physical meaning, by the way. This is completely new ideas. Certainly, completely. New. How much these are constructive? I think. Can, they cannot be constructive, right? You know, these numbers grow dramatically. So how can you produce a geometric construction which produces, you know, 1,000 million rational curves of degree 20, which so I don't know if I, if I got uh, your point. So it's uh, a development what that could not have been possible without the Greek the huge computational power that we... With the point of view now. of Greek mathematicians, what we are doing nowadays would simply... They, they would simply not... Probably they would simply not consider what we do as a solution of the problem. But their solution of the problem is basically impossible to, you know, human brain, right? Producing construction... By the way, they were, they were working over the reals over the real number in the, in the real, this is a complete nightmare. You know, you know that configurations of plane curves of degree D are known, all possible configuration of degree D plane curves, real plane curves are known up to degree seven. As soon as you go to degree eight, the possible configuration of plane curves of degree D, real plane curves are unknown. So, and I can assure you that very strong methods have been implemented to understand this problem. This is an extremely hard problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions or comments? The students are most welcome because it's a... Uh... Mm -hmm. Relevant... Uh 
biological problem that you can try to answer by, by using these techniques or not? These are used every day. <laughs> these are used every, every day. Which question? Okay, Which? so, you know, um, viruses mm, uh, uh, mutate e extremely quickly, okay? So if you want to find a medicine which uh, hits certain virus, you have to understand the evolution of the viruses. In order to understand the, the, the evolution of the viruses, you have to understand this phylogenetic tree, okay? And so there are programs that every day are used in, you know, this uh, uh, people who, who study production of medicines uh, from pharmaceutical uh, industries in which they, 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 they use the, 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 these phylogenetic trees in order... <laughs> So <laughs> the typical thing is the following. No? You have a certain number of species. So, typically, they are viruses, viruses. But you, know, you have a certain number of, of, uh, of uh, species. And you fix attention on a certain segment of DNA. These species are somehow similar in a certain sense. They are close to each other. And you fix the attention on a certain segment of DNA. No? And you want to see. The, 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 how distant they are. So you look at uh, a, a, a segment of DNA and, and you are trying to reconstruct from the differences of the segment what is the right phylogenetic tree in order to understand from, you know, what is the phylogenetic distance of one to the other. And, uh, you know, there are several mathematical techniques which have been implemented in programs which these people use every day. More questions or comments? I guess we can thank the speaker and uh,